Welcome to Protect Sensitive Data in Use with AWS Confidential Computing. My name is Arvind, and I'm the specialist responsible for the confidential computing business in AWS. I will be jointly presenting this session with J.D. Bean, Principal Security Architect, EC2, and Alex Rudziris, Software Development Engineer from Stripe. Before I begin, I would first like to start by thanking every one of you for choosing to spend your time here with us today. You have a lot of choices in an event like this, but you chose us. I'm both humbled and grateful. I would also want to let you know I'm one more thing today. I'm super excited, because for the first time, we have one of our customers with us today to share their journey in building applications leveraging Nitro Enclaves. So you're not just gonna hear from JD and me, but you're going to hear from Stripe about their experience using Nitro Enclaves and confidential computing capabilities from AWS. No matter where you are in your cloud journey, if you are in the business of building applications that process sensitive data, and you're looking for mechanisms to protect this data, you are in the right session. If you're not in any of this business, but you still chose to be here, I applaud your curiosity. We'll make it count. We'll make sure you learn something new today. Let me begin by first setting the agenda for what we're going to discuss today. I'll start <clears throat> by introducing our perspective on confidential computing and talk a little bit about the different security and privacy dimensions of confidential computing. Then we'll go ahead and introduce the Nitro system and talk to you about our no operator access assurance. We'll then switch gears and talk a little bit about Nitro Enclaves itself and discuss a little bit about key features and benefits. Then you're going to hear from Stripe about their journey, their experience in building applications leveraging Nitro Enclaves. I'll then share a little bit more about other use cases leveraging Nitro Enclaves and then close the session out with some resources for you to learn more. So what is confidential computing? You know, every year I do the session, I try, to, I try to ask for a show of hands. So I'm gonna do that again. I wanna see the numbers growing. The cult is getting bigger. How many of you know about confidential computing? As I thought. Two years ago when I did this, there were maybe two people in the room who raised their hand. So we're definitely doing something right. We're, we're seeing over half the, half the audience know about confidential computing. That's a win, in my opinion. Let me share our perspective on it. At AWS, we define confidential computing as the use of specialized hardware and associated firmware to protect data in use from any unauthorized access. The key to focus here is protecting data in use. If you take a step back and think about what you do with data, we do three main things with it. We store it, we move it, we process it. That's it, everything we do with data can be bucketed under this. The mechanisms to protect data while the data is at rest and in transit have existed for a while. What we are doing with confidential computing is extending that protection and providing capabilities where you can protect this data when it's in use. So now you have end-to-end -end protection, protecting data at rest, in transit, and in use. That's really the focus of confidential computing. That's why we're focusing on discussing about protecting data in use today. Upon speaking to customers and partners, we have identified two distinct security and privacy dimensions that customers want to protect their code and data from. Dimension one is where customers want to ensure that their data remains protected from any operator from the cloud, cloud provider. In this case, that would be AWS. Dimension two is where the customers want to protect their data even from themselves, even from admin level users or malicious actors who could pose as admin level users and gain access to data. Now, all of this was a little bit of a mouthful with the definition, with the dimensions and everything. If you forget about everything I talked about today and just want to take away something, confidential computing, protecting data in use. Two distinct security and privacy dimensions you protected from. Dimension one from us, dimension two from you. That's it. That's the crux of the session. If you are clear about this, the rest of it is going to be easy to follow today. So what are these data types that customers are concerned about protecting, right? Not all data is created equal. There's innocuous data and there's sensitive data. 
when we are talking about confidential computing, most often we are only talking about sensitive data. Not everything needs the same kind of protection. Here's a few examples of data types that are considered to be sensitive. Personally identifiable information, healthcare information, financial information, digital assets, intellectual property like machine learning models. These are all what we see as being used most often when customers are looking at confidential computing capabilities. But the data types are not limited to this. I just put a few examples here for you. None of this data is new to the cloud. That's what you have to remember. None of this is new to the cloud. This has been in the cloud for a while. And customers have been processing this, using this in the cloud for a long time. But what's happening right now is there's more awareness around wanting to protect this data while it's being processed, be it due to regulatory and compliance requirements or be it because they want to up their security game, whatever the case may be. And the workloads are also evolving. The requirements are changing. That's why we are discussing more and more about confidential computing these days. That's why you're hearing more about it. Okay, now you know what's confidential computing. You know what the data types are. You know what they want to protect. But how are we doing it from AWS? We have two distinct solutions. Number one is our AWS Nitro system. The Nitro system is the foundation of all of the virtualization that powers modern EC2 instances. When I say modern, that's all of the EC2 instances we launched since early 2018. And with the Nitro system, we address dimension one by default. So if you're running a Nitro-based EC2 instance today, your content is already protected from AWS operators. That's dimension one. No operator access. Number two, AWS Nitro Enclaves. With Nitro Enclaves, we provide you with the capability to spin up an isolated and hardened compute environment which provides further isolation on top of what Nitro system already provided, so you can isolate even yourselves from the data. And that's dimension two. I'm now going to invite JD Bean on stage to talk to you about the Nitro system in depth. JD. Thanks. Hi, all. So, uh, as Art men uh, Arvin mentioned, uh, I am J.D. Bean. I am Principal Security and Sovereignty Architect under our AWS Compute Services uh, organization. Uh, so I want to underscore something that Arvind said, uh, just to make sure that we all walk away with this as a baseline. Uh, if you are here to learn uh, what you as a customer need to do to protect your sensitive data and code within an EC2 instance from access by an AWS operator, the answer is use and select a modern EC2 instance for your workload. That is a number of instances we released in 2017, and every single EC2 instance type that we have released from the beginning of 2018 onward. That's it. Um, now, if that's what you're here for, uh, you could take a break, check your email, uh, spend a few minutes. If you're watching at home, feel free and skip forward a few minutes. I hope that you don't, though. Because what I want to talk about a little bit is how we've designed the system to enable that outcome. Um, in our shared responsibility model, this is about security and privacy of the cloud. So to understand the Nitro system, it's very useful uh, to understand a little bit about the journey that got us to the Nitro system. So pictured here is not the Nitro system. Uh, pictured here is a high-level logical representation of a, I'll call sort of a classical virtualized, uh, virtualization system. Uh, specifically, uh, as you'll note, you have the word Zen there. This portrays the Zen hypervisor and uses terminology that is familiar in the Zen system. Before we had the Nitro system, we were actually using Zen. Uh, and this particular instance, right, the last instance we released that looked like this, was actually way back in 2012. So, we look at the system, and you know, at, at the time, when this was released in 2012, this was a state-of-the-art design. Uh, and still, today, the vast, overwhelming majority of production virtualization systems in the world still more or less look like that. But we looked at it, and we said this is a you know, perfectly fine system. It meets our bar, but we want to take it further. Uh, and we saw some room for improvement. One of the things we saw was that uh, the CPU cores that ran on our virtualization system, we had to allocate 
quite a bit of resources, up to 30%, for doing kind of boring housekeeping tasks. Things like converting customer EC2 instance network traffic and um, emulating a virtual device and then uh, you know, encapsulating that in our software-defined network uh, and shuffling packets around. And we had these really expensive general purpose CPUs that we wanted to be able to allocate fully to our customers. So we started out and we had an idea. And that was to take our VPC networking component, right? This is, um, I actually take a quick step back here, right? What's going on in this picture? Um, so we have our Zen hypervisor. That's like the core of the virtualization system. Uh, what this does is uh, more or less manages a little bit of shadow state, allocates out resources for virtual machines, uh, and sort of just handles some of the privileged instructions, the things that like uh, you don't want a virtual, every virtual machine to be able to do because it would undermine the security and integrity of the overall virtualization system. The little orange boxes are the part that most of our customers care the most about. Those are their AC2 instances. And then there's a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and all of it tracks back to this DOM zero. DOM0 uh, exists to allow our virtualization system, the Zen hypervisor, to actually be useful for customers, to provide things like I.O. for networking or network attached storage like EBS or even locally attached storage. Uh, it also provides all the management, the governance, the security, the monitoring, and the orchestration that allows our customers to uh, put in an API request that says EC2 run instance uh, and sort of get their very own virtual machine in the cloud. And all of that stuff runs inside DOM0. It's a special purpose virtual machine that's a copy of a general purpose operating system. For AWS, we used our own Amazon Linux. So taking a look at the system, we, we saw that VPC networking capability and we thought, saw that it was using a lot of resources. And we thought to ourselves, we think we can offer better performance in terms of networking for customers and uh, you know, better compute performance and security uh, for what's left on the box. So we took that component out and we removed it from the system mainboard and we ran it in a new custom silicon device uh, attached to the instance, uh, what we called a Nitro card. So we moved VPC networking off to its own system on a chip, its own computer, basically, uh, with its own CPU, its own memory, uh, that was custom built and designed to operate in our, uh, our software-defined infrastructure. And it worked really well. Um, customers really loved it. It achieved the ends that we, we, we wanted. And we looked at, at the system and we thought, maybe we can take it further. The next natural choice was to look at our EBS storage. So we moved that off into a new custom-built card that actually worked kind of similarly. On the back end, it was uh, communicating over our uh, internal networks to EBS storage servers. EBS is a, is a network-provided storage layer. Uh, and, but on the local side, it was presenting an interface of a local NVMe drive to customer instances. So it was doing a lot of the same networking stuff on the back side, um, just presenting, presenting a different interface and doing slightly different work, presenting that into the, to the EC2 instance. And that worked really well. So we kept going. And we pulled off local storage as well. Um, these are locally connected drives. And we created new Nitro cards and connected them up and we're able to remove even more um, housekeeping tasks from the main CPU. And then we decided to really go for it. Uh, the last thing that was running in DOMU now was the management, the security, the monitoring, all that orchestration software that sort of makes a virtual machine system useful at scale for our customers. So we pulled that off as well. And once that was now into its own card, a special card, we call it the Nitro Controller card. Um, she's sort of the queen. Uh, Dom Yu started to sort of look a bit like a vestigial organ. It, we didn't, it didn't really have a purpose anymore. So we completed our journey of evolution and came up with something radically different. We removed Dom Yu, and at the same time, we also removed the Zen hypervisor. We replaced it with our own custom uh, in-house built Nitro hypervisor built on KVM, the Linux uh, kernel virtualization module. And we now have this incredibly thin, I would describe it as firmware-like hypervisor. Instead of having to run the Zen hypervisor along with a full copy of an operating system, we were able to remove 
any general purpose, uh, Amazon managed general purpose computing environment from the system mainboard where we were running our customer workloads. So the Nitro hypervisor uh, is super tiny. It lacks all sorts of things that you would expect from a general computing environment. It doesn't have a shell. It doesn't have a networking stack or a general purpose file system. Um, it's very much treated and managed as an injectable firmware module. And this meant, from the performance standpoint, uh, that we were able to dedicate the full resources of one of the underlying host servers for EC2 directly to our customers. This provided huge improvements in things like jitter uh, and, and performance and cost value uh, propositions. Now, I could go on and on and on about all the incredible things the Nitro system has allowed us to do, but since this is a confidential computing talk, I'm gonna focus in on that very specific benefit that it provides. But do know that there's a ton of other incredible benefits that the Nitro system has brought with it, both from a security and privacy standpoint and from a performance standpoint. So, a quick overview, right? The Nitro system, we call it a system, it is built of three main types of components. The first are the Nitro cards. Um, these are the cards that I described earlier. These are the custom-built uh, silicon, actually built and designed by Annapurna Labs, the same group that's responsible for Tranium, Inferentia, and our Graviton chips. This is actually where our relationship with them began. Uh, we also have uh, Nitro cards that are responsible for the components of the local storage, the VPC networking, and the EBS. Uh, storage components. Integrated onto the system mainboard, we have a special component called the Nitro Security Chip. This has some interesting uh, and really important functionality for our system. It allows the Nitro controller card to bridge its root of trust onto the system mainboard. So what happens is when the system starts up, the Nitro uh, Security Chip actually holds the system in reset and allows the Nitro controller card to come in and to validate every single piece of non-volatile storage on the system mainboard to ensure that only known good trusted code is running on that box. In operation, it also provides a defense in depth, blocking any sorts of rights to non-volatile storage from the main CPU. Lastly is the Nitro hypervisor. Now, technically, this one deserves an asterisk, as we do offer bare metal servers, thanks to, thank you to, the, uh, thanks to the Nitro system that doesn't involve any Nitro hypervisor. But for our virtualized systems, which are the vast majority of our EC2 instances, um, we have this incredible lightweight hypervisor. It provides basic memory and CPU allocation, sets up connections between the cards and the, uh, the instances, the virtual machines, directly, and then steps back. Uh, it effectively is not there. And so we have some inc uh, really incredible metrics that you can go and look and compare the performance of a bare metal instance with its virtualized equivalent and see the incredibly slim performance difference. Now, is that a particular security benefit? No. Um, but it's indicative of just how small and narrow the software that makes up the Nitro hypervisor really is. So on the right here, uh, you actually get to see a few of what these Nitro cards look like. They have evolved uh, over the years. We're now on our fifth generation of Nitro chip. And this is the really important feature that I wanted to, to underscore, because it's so critical to confidential computing and why the Nitro system is the fundamental basis of confidential computing throughout AWS. In designing the system from the ground up to run at scale within our environment, we were able to make a really important choice on behalf of our customers, which is to provide no mechanism whatsoever for an AWS operator to log into the Nitro hypervisor or any of the Nitro cards. Now, I want to be clear here. Uh, even going back in the Zen days, right, we had all sorts of controls and protections and monitoring, et cetera, to protect uh, against the potential, you know, any potential operator uh, activity. However, with the Nitro system, we took that a step further, building in a technical restriction, in fact, the absence of a mechanism altogether to log in. The Nitro hypervisor itself has no SSH server, as I mentioned. It has no connection to our network, even. The only thing that the Nitro hypervisor can communicate with is with the Nitro cards themselves. And similarly, the Nitro cards 
also have no SSH server. Uh, instead, the only communication that they have with the outside world is through inbound API operations that are authenticated, authorized, logged, and audited. And what is incredibly, incredibly important is that none of those APIs have the ability to access customer data in EC2 memory, encrypted EBS volumes, or encrypted network traffic. Now, over the last few years, we've made some, some big strides in providing greater transparency and assurance to our customers around this design and its attributes. Uh, first is the uh, security design of the AWS Nitro system, which is a detailed white paper going into a number of the topics I discussed today in greater depth, as well as covering a lot of the other security benefits that we didn't touch on today. If you're interested, I encourage you to give a look. If you'd rather not read that paper, but would rather see uh, sort of a third party's view on a deep dive into the Nitro system, we brought in the NCC group, uh, a well-respected uh, security group, to come in and assess the AWS Nitro system architecture to look at our artifacts, to interview our most senior engineers. Uh, and ultimately, uh, spoiler alert, they found that there was no gaps in the Nitro system that would compromise any of the security claims that we make about the absence of AWS operator access. Finally, we also added these commitments into our service terms themselves. This isn't something that we did just for our biggest or most security conscious customers, but it's something that we did uh, and benefits each and every customer that signs up for an AWS account, whether they're a solo developer or, uh, or, or an intelligence agency. Um, so with that said, uh, you know, I, I hope that you uh, took away from this just how seriously uh, we've taken the investment uh, and development of the Nitro system in providing confidential, uh, confidential computing by default for our customers. With that, I'll invite Arvind uh, back up to speak about Nitro Enclaves and the second dimension of confidential computing. Thank you, JD. So you've heard us talk about confidential computing, what our perspective on it is, the two different dimensions, security and privacy dimensions from which you want to protect data. And now you know all about the Nitro system. <clears throat> so now we can talk about enclaves. What is AWS Nitro enclaves? To understand enclaves, we'll have to first take a look at what a normal EC2 host looks like. And if you're getting the drift of this, we always like to compare with something so we can make our point. You saw that with the Nitro system too, right? All right, so on, on the screen here, we have this big white box, which is what your standard instance looks like today. And within the instance, you have a bunch of different things. You have the OS, you have the application that's going to process your data. Maybe you have some third-party libraries you leverage to build your applications and different users who could have different levels of access to the instance. Now, when it's game time and you have to process data, you're going to bring encrypted data into the instance. But to process it, you will have to decrypt it. You can't, you can't process encrypted data at scale yet. Once you decrypt it, you're revealing plain text to all of the entities that are in the instance today. And that's really the model that you have to start thinking about. Do you want any of those entities that have access to the instance to gain access to that data? And if you don't want that, if you want to replicate this environment that we created for you, to create one for yourself, that's really when you start thinking about Nitro Enclaves. With Nitro Enclaves, you have the capability to carve out CPU and memory resources from your own EC2 instance. If you're running an instance today, you can carve out CPU and memory resources from it to create a Nitro Enclave. And by creating that, you're creating a hardened and isolated compute environment within which you can then proceed to decrypt your data, reveal plain text to the enclave, to the application residing in the enclave to process that data. With Nitro Enclaves, you're getting additional isolation on top of what you already got with the Nitro system. So that's what Nitro Enclaves is about. So really, like when you start making your choices about what to use when, the, the question to ask yourself is, what are you protecting and who are you protecting it from? The answer to that will guide the solution that you're going to use here. Enclaves can also provide proof of identity. So this is where attestation comes into picture. 
So the Enclave brings with it an attestation document signed by the Nitro hypervisor that you heard JD talk about. The hypervisor has measurements, it has hashes of the Enclave image that you created. The application that's running in the Enclave, the specific application that's going to process your sensitive data. The parent instance ID, and then some IAM information, the role of the parent instance, and you can also do user-defined info, like nonce if you're concerned about replay attacks and you want to protect against that, then you could define that as well. And with the attestation document, the Enclave is now able to prove its identity to another entity it wants to establish trust with before you start exchanging data, before you start providing secrets to the Enclave. And we ourselves leverage this to provide first-class integration with AWS KMS. Most often we find customers using AWS KMS when they use Nitro Enclaves. And to establish trust with KMS, the Enclave provides the attestation document. When you built the Enclave, you would have received these measurements from the Enclave image file that you created. Now you could set up your key policy with KMS and use the key policy to check against the attestation document you received from the Enclave. If the, if the attestation document, the measurements in the attestation document match those of the key policy, then KMS now knows that it can share secrets with this Enclave. It's not any Enclave, but it's this specific Enclave running that specific application that is set to process the sensitive data that you're expecting it to, to process. So we provide first-class integration with KMS but you're not by any means tied to AWS KMS. If you want to use your own key management service, you're free to. The only difference is you'll have to write that plumbing we just talked about, you know, matching the key policy and all of that. But the attestation document is available for you, regardless of whether it's KMS or not. So having heard about, you know, the Nitro system, confidential computing, Nitro enclaves, how to use it, where to use it, let's talk a little bit about the features and benefits of Nitro enclaves. First thing is additional isolation and security. So when I talk to you about this hardened and isolated compute environment that you're creating, there are some guidelines that come with it. There are some things that make it a hardened and isolated compute environment. Number one, the Enclave does not have any external network connectivity. So it's, it, it cannot talk to the outside world. It has to go through the parent instance to talk to the outside world. Number two, there is no persistent storage. And number three, there's no root user access. There is just no interactive access. You cannot SSH into an enclave. In fact, the only communication channel that exists between the enclave and everything else is a secure local channel through which the enclave talks to the parent instance from which it was spun up from. So the thing to remember here is you've created a enclave-based environment to protect sensitive data and process it inside the enclave, which means when you're bringing data from the external world to the enclave, it's incumbent on you to make sure that you're not revealing plain text to the parent instance. The parent instance only acts as a conduit to the enclave. So wherever you've stored this encrypted data, you bring it still encrypted through the parent instance through that secure local channel into the enclave and then proceed to decrypt it. So the enclave is providing additional isolation by making sure there's no external connectivity and storage and all of that. But as you build your applications, as you bring data, as you take care of your data flow, you have to keep in mind that you're not revealing plain text to the parent instance. Second big feature, benefit, if you will, is flexibility. So I talked about the ability for you to create enclaves by allocating CPU and memory resources. And you can scale this as you please. This depends on the size of the application that you're gonna drop inside the enclave. The, the data payload that you're planning to bring inside the enclave to be processed. So depending on that, you can choose how much CPU and how, many, how much memory you wanna allocate to spin up this enclave and run your application in there. So there's a lot of flexibility there. There's a lot of instance sizes and types that we have made available for you. For you, to, for you to make it Enclave enabled. And to me, the most exciting part of this flexibility piece is that it's processor agnostic. So it does not matter if you're using x86 Intel or AMD or ARM-based Graviton CPUs in your fleet. 
you can spin up enclaves from any of this. We have support for all of these different CPU types as well. And then lastly, cryptographic attestation. So we touched a little bit on this. I talked to you about the attestation document that the Nitro hypervisor signs and sends over. So that helps the enclave prove its identity and authorize the code that's running inside the enclave. And we have leveraged that ourselves by providing first-class integration with KMS as well. So we've made it a lot more easier to use with a natural uh, integration with KMS and taking the heavy lifting off you if you have to do this attestation flow yourself. So now you know about enclaves, now you know features and benefits, so where is it really used? Like what kind of applications does you know, take advantage of enclaves? Here's a high level look of it before I go into actual use cases and workloads, right? Cryptographic operations, if you want to decrypt data, we've been talking about it from when I started the session, right? Signature validation, tokenization, masking, inferencing with machine learning models, whatnot. These are some high-level constructs that you can think about when you're thinking about, okay, what are the use cases? Where do I apply this? Where does this really matter? And here's just a smattering of uh, different customers from various different segments who are, uh, who are using enclaves right now, and I see some in the audience as well, so thank you. Thank you for using, and thank you for being here. Um, that said, I now want to invite Alex from Stripe to talk to you about their journey, about their experience using Nitro Enclaves in building applications that process sensitive data. Alex. Thank you, Arvind. So my name is Alex. I'm a staff software engineer with Stripe. And raise your hands if you've heard of Stripe before. Well, every, almost everyone's hand went up. Uh, well, I was gonna say, if you hadn't heard of us, if you've ever used a card to make a payment online or in person, there's a good chance that Stripe has facilitated a payment between you and a merchant. Stripe is a company that offers payment processing services and APIs for applications ranging from point of sale to mobile devices. Billions of companies of all sizes use Stripe to accept payments, send payouts, and automate other financial processes. To do this, to process billions of dollars of payments and move money for our customers, Stripe has to handle a lot of sensitive information. This includes information we get from customers, like credit card numbers, bank account numbers, transaction details, and PII, such as email addresses and phone numbers. But then we also have to actually move that money through the financial world. And to do this, we need to communicate with other entities, like banks and credit card networks. This means we must also protect the information we use to identify ourselves to these networks and also protect data in transit. Lastly, we must protect the keys that we use to secure all of our data internally and also both at rest and in transit. So I wanna talk about how, what we're looking for when we're looking for a solution for protecting our most sensitive keys. We're looking for something that allows us to fundamentally restrict the access to this key material. In most cases, this means restricting it so that there's no way a human can handle the key directly. We want only our trusted services to have access to these keys or even knowledge of what these keys are. We also want our ideal solution to produce an audit trail of when any of that key material is used and what it is used for. Lastly, we want to ensure any of that software that interacts directly with those keys that may use it and generate that audit trail has been reviewed by at least two individuals and gone through our standard release process. So Stripe has historically used a variety of different tools and techniques for securing these keys. We've done everything from OS level hardening to at times actually using dedicated hardware security modules. And the precise tool we use depends on both the sensitivity of the data and sometimes the compliance standards that we're subject to. AWS Nitro Enclaves provided us a new opportunity or a new way to secure these cryptographic keys. And let's take a quick look at why this solution was a good fit for us. As Arvind mentioned, there's no external communication by default. This means we're able to control the channels through which the software running in the Enclave communicates and reduce the risk of exfiltration through channels we did not um, intend. 
Uh, this means, as we mentioned, there's no local storage, so you don't have to worry about it getting written to disk, showing up in a core memory dump, um, and, and things like that. There's also no interactive de access by default. So this means that even though, even, even in this rare cases that we want to allow debug access for engineers in production, we don't have to worry about an engineer accidentally being exposed to one of these keys. Enclaves are also easy to provision and upgrade. I mentioned hardware security modules provide some of the best in class security. They're some of the safest places you can store keys. But they're very cumbersome to deploy, they're cumbersome to upgrade, and they don't play well with the tools that we use to manage other more traditional Linux servers. Enclaves, on the other hand, were really easy to provision with our, within our existing AWS environment and played well with a lot of the existing tools we were already using. HSMs are also incredibly expensive, and Nitro Enclaves were great because it gave us a way to secure data by just securing the compute resources we were already using, rather than having to buy a box that would have to live somewhere else. However, like HSMs, we wanted to have really tight control over the, the firmware or the, the software that runs in that secure context. And Enclaves gave us a great way to make sure that we're only releasing keys to these enclaves when we're absolutely positive that we're running the correct software on them. And lastly, because we are running in AWS, we wanted a solution that allowed us to use the, the primitives in AWS we're already used to, such as for things like authorization, authentication, and key management. So with enclaves, we get that. So let me walk you through the solution we built with Nitro Enclaves. When a typical service instance build, spins up, we set up a parent service, which is kind of our typical application service, which will respond to requests from the outside, interact with outside storage, and so on. We also spin up um, a Nitro Enclave, which is gonna be the component that handles the key material directly. Uh, there's also a couple of support services that show up uh, related to proxying network requests and logging, and I'll speak to those momentarily. The reason in this context for the separate enclave service is that we want to make sure all the keys are handled in that environment uh, and is that separate from the parent service. Our goal is to handle them in a process that is isolated from outside communication, can't accidentally write to local storage, and we have tight controls on um, what, what exact software is there. The interesting part is how do we get these keys into the enclave when we're starting up? So what happens when one of these EC2 instances bootstraps, the Enclave service will request of the parent service a KMS encrypted copy of all the keys it needs to run to do whatever task it has been allocated. The Enclave takes these encrypted keys. It also gets from the Nitro security module a copy of its attestation certificate. And it also requests the Nitro security module included in that attestation document a copy uh, of a ephemeral public key associated with that enclave. The enclave then, through the proxy service, makes a request to KMS. KMS will then validate the attestation document, ensure that the request was made from an enclave matching one of these, uh, one of the allow listed uh, measurements of software, and it will then re-encrypt the keys to the public key pre presented in that attestation document. Those are returned back to the Enclave. The Enclave decrypts it with its ephemeral private key, and now it has the keys in memory it needs to operate. After we do this, we mark all the services as healthy and we're ready to serve requests. For availability and latency reasons, we only do that key loading at startup. Once an Enclave, in our case, is bootstrapped, we run with all the keys we need in memory, uh, and this is to avoid round trips to KMS each time we have to handle a request. A couple of other things on there. We have the uh, logging, we have the proxy service also will proxy uh, requests to our uh, observability platform. And we also have a logging service which facilitates write, um, writes to an error log on disk from the Nitro Enclave. And we'll talk more about those in a little bit. So what did we have to build ourselves to make all of this work? So first we had to build some client-side tooling to run within the Enclave itself. 
Stripe uses a few different languages, but our initial use cases were targeting services that we had written in Go. We wanted to avoid using the AWS provided Rust SDK through C bindings as C Go had been a source of frustration in the past for us. We ended up building our own tooling for allowing the Enclave to communicate with a Nitro security module and make calls to KMS within Go. We also, in our case, built our own TCP and UDP proxy. While AWS did provide us a TCP proxy, we needed UDP, UDP support for some of the observability solutions we were using. And although we could have used a network proxy to ship logs directly from the Enclave to our log store, for performance reasons, we wanted to, sep to aggregate the logs on the parent instance, so we built another logging proxy that would allow us to output a merit messages to a file on the parent instance before we ship them off to our log store. The last thing we built, which was sort of interesting, was is that we really wanted to maintain the invariant within Stripe that all communication between services happens over TLS. We saw the opportunity to establish trust between the parent service and the enclave by building off of the attestation primitives once again. And what we did is additionally on the startup, the enclave will generate a self-signed TLS certificate, which it sends as part of an attestation document to the parent. Just like KMS, the parent validates the attestation document, matches the measurements it expected, and then will then use that certificate for future communications with the enclave. In this way, we know that the, the parent service can be confident when it reaches over that VSOC that it is communicating with the correct enclave. It also avoids us having to do the attestation dance for each individual request. One little interesting performance hiccup we hit while deploying this. And originally, we, we, built, we did some early proof of concept testing before deploying a more production-ready service into a Nitro Enclave. But when we deployed that kind of more finalized version, we noticed there was a regression in performance, especially in terms of latency and throughput we were seeing from the Enclave. After a bunch of kind of ad hoc debugging and trial and error, we were curious when we noticed that when we disabled logging, the performance issues went away. This kind of confused us because we knew we were definitely not saturating the overall network bandwidth between the EC2, um, the parent service and the, and the enclave. And after doing our own research and having some conversations with engineers at AWS, we came to understand that what we're running into was a limitation with the Linux, Linux virtual SOC implementation. And that was that it did not efficiently handle um, kind of multiple concurrent network streams. And the reason for this was is that all traffic, regardless of the ports involved, is multiplexed over the same underlying queue in a VSOC. And as we described, we have different proxies running for different things. We're sending logging information, we're doing the actual RPCs, and we're also sending observability. And our log statements were sitting in that queue, the same queue as our API responses, which was kind of gumming up the works. In our case, it just meant that we had to be much more frugal when it came to deciding what we were gonna log. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't be the prolific loggers that we were in our other production services. Uh, but we made it work. And we deployed this all to production uh, earlier this year, and since doing that, we really haven't thought about enclaves at all, which is exactly what we wanted. Um, a few things we did notice, though. One was performance, and that is we experienced no overall performance overhead from adding non enclaves to our solution. And we actually saw more consistent latency in our applications because we eliminated a network hop where previously we're sometimes going to an, a, a different host to do some of the cryptographic operations. We greatly simplified our deployment infrastructure and we were able to remove a lot of the complexity we had built ourselves to try to harden hosts at the OS level where instead now we can just use the Nitro Enclave primitives. We reduced toil for our operators by making it really easy to replace instances and do OS upgrades because the keys can just be loaded into the Enclave itself because the, the trust is kind of built in. And related to this, um, we were actually able to remove a, a critical uh, risk for failure by because we can now, again, because the instances can come up automatically, we can auto-recover from failures much faster. And in one case, we were able to reduce the time to recovery from hours to minutes. Because again, we can just trust these enclaves to bootstrap themselves. So thank you. This was our journey with enclaves. And I'd like to hand it back to Arvind to discuss some other customer use cases. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> thank you. 
So hopefully you heard about the use case and you know, uh, also some of the gotchas, right? If you're developing with something new like enclaves, you know, what do you have to look for? Uh, some of the performance limitations and, and some of the choices that, that you have to make when you, when you build with this. But more importantly, you know, I left that slide up here because you, cho you make choices like enclaves to up your security game to protect data, but there's also other benefits that tumble out of this, right? And, and that's what you're seeing here, right? Reduce toil and complexity. These are not easy to measure, but these go a long way in reducing your everyday overhead, right? So there's, there's always more than what meets the eye. Of course, we focus on security and privacy when we do this talk, but there's definitely a lot more benefits in the, in the background. Next comes the most, most exciting uh, part of this, this session, in my opinion. Um, yeah, it's, it's a concluding section, but it's also a section where I get to talk about the art of possible, right? So there are some other popular use cases that, that I want to leave you with before I close this. And no, no tech talk in 2023 is complete without talking about machine learning, right? So, so here, here it is, machine learning, right? So think about, think about Nitro Enclaves. Where can you apply it, right, in addition to what you've already heard? Let's take a scenario where I have a machine learning model I've trained and ready to go. I want to license this. I want to monetize this. But this is my secret sauce. I don't want anybody to see the model. In that scenario, anybody who has a data set that they want to use with this model and draw some insights can potentially bring their encrypted data set, drop it inside an enclave, and then I could drop the machine learning model inside the enclave. And the model can now work on the data. They can draw their insights out of it, at the end of which I take my model away, they take their data away, and we both did not see each other's information. I didn't get to see their data, they didn't get to see the model. This is just one example. The art of possible, if you will, right? If you're in the business of machine learning and building models and thinking about, okay, how to monetize it, but how, I, how do I make sure I protect my IP? So this is not just a use case where you're protecting data. Here, you're protecting your IP, so truly protecting content. And there's another party who's protecting their data here. Now we're trending towards you know, um, multiple parties starting to use this, and I will touch on it a little bit uh, in, in, in a couple of slides. The next, next use case I want to highlight here, a completely different vertical, right, ad tech. Um, if, you're, if you're in the know about the segment, you're probably aware that uh, cookies are going away. And uh, it was, they were supposed to go away this year. They've given it a year-long extension, so it's probably going to go away end of next year. At least that's what we're told. So cookies are going away. So now publishers are under pressure to identify alternate mechanisms to protect your personal information but at the same time, make sense out of it so they can continue to publish personalized advertisements to you. So tokenization is one mechanism that's starting to emerge as a mechanism of choice to do this. UID2, which is Unified ID 2.0, was jointly developed with Trade Desk. And there are other tokenization identifiers that are starting to, starting to get developed. And Nitro Enclaves provides a very organic environment to do this because you could potentially bring encrypted PII into the Enclave, proceed to decrypt it, tokenize it, and then send the token downstream for personalized ads and whatnot to get published. So tokenization, another big use case in ad tech. Just one thing, but ad tech has a lot of other uses. You can think about uh, bidding. If you're in the ad tech business, you can think about bidding. So there can be public bidding and private bidding, and private bidding could potentially happen inside an enclave where the bid information and results are kept contained to a very, very isolated environment. Now we get into multi-party collaboration, right? So we talked about this machine learning model and data set. We talked about, okay, ad tech. There's other use cases. Now let's continue on that ad tech theme and think about you know, multi-party collaboration. If there are multiple parties, with data sets. Let's just take there's a social media company A and B, and both have data about me. They each have drawn some insights about me and have sent me personal information in the past. Sorry, personal ads in the past. But they both have slightly different information about me and could benefit from collaborating. But they don't want to share their data with each other. Now, they could both drop their encrypted data sets inside the enclave and a, 
a pre-agreed upon application could pro process these multiple data sets, draw insights, and send it out to both parties without either party ever gaining access to the other person's data. I gave you a social media use case here, but the use cases here are far, far reaching. Right? There's, there's a lot more we can talk about. Um, after the session, JD and myself will, will stay back to, to sign autographs, I'm kidding, to, to do Q&A, uh, and we'll be happy to talk about other use cases as well, uh, where you know, multi-party collaboration is, is, a, is a big construct and how nitro enclaves and similar technologies are being used. Okay. And then, of course, uh, this was the flavor last year, so I still left it on here uh, for, for, for discussion. Right? Blockchain workloads. Uh, blockchain, crypto, Web3, whatever your business might be if you're involved in it. Um, there are multiple different workloads within, within that vertical where a secure environment like Enclaves is very, very applicable, right? Uh, blockchain bridging. If you have multiple chains, maybe it's, it's uh, Bitcoin, maybe it's Ethereum, and data needs to get exchanged between, between multiple different chains, the data has to actually pass through a node, a compute node, before the data can be moved over to the, to the other chain. And that need, node needs to be secure. So that's another big use case that's starting to emerge. Hot wallets. So if you're doing digital assets transaction, right? So if you're familiar with wallets, there's two types. There's cold wallets and hot wallets. Hot wallets are where, where the transactions happen. That's what's kept alive all the time. And this is where ownership, ownership transfer, assets transfer, all of the personal information is being revealed to make these transactions. So all of these can also be done inside the Enclave. And lastly, a signature validation. So we talked about MPC, which is multi-party collaboration. So if you're developing an MPC wallet and you've sharded your keys and you have these keys, each key being signed in a different place, that can also be done utilizing enclaves. Each of the keys can be signed separately in an enclave and then you can pull it through your consensus or whatever it is that you do with, with Nitro Enclaves. So these are all just the art of possible in different verticals. So hopefully this gave you an idea outside of say payment processing, where else is it getting used and what are the different constructs um, that are pretty popular uh, for confidential computing and a feature like Nitro Enclaves. Um, I would like to close this session by leaving you with some resources. If any of this talk uh, you know, sparked your curiosity and if you want to learn more, and I highly encourage you to learn more and take advantage of this, uh, we do have a, um, our Nitro Enclaves webpage where you can go learn more about the instance type, sizes, the features, and, and you know, what's new with Enclaves. Uh, we also have a Nitro Enclaves workshop. This is a self-help, self-paced workshop that you can just go run and you can learn how to spin up an enclave, you can learn how to use the cryptographic attestation that we talked about, the whole integration with KMS, everything has been worked in that, in that workshop for you. So I would encourage you to do that. It takes about an hour or so to finish. Uh, highly, highly useful. And of course, lastly, I'll leave you with a confidential compute blog where we have shared our perspective in detail. What do we do, why do we do it, and how we have done it. Right? And if you're looking to learn more about compute, not just restricted to conference computing, we are launching a new learning series um, called Badge That, and uh, you could learn about all of the compute options uh, from AWS, and you'll also earn a digital badge as part of that. I'll close this session with this. I thank you very much for spending your time with us today, and I hope it was useful for you. Thank you.